Yeah, I've done that sometimes. Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Power of Your Mind podcast. You are listening to episode number 216. I'm Victoria Gallagher, Law of Attraction hypnotist and number one bestselling author of Practical Law of Attraction, Align Yourself with the Manifesting Conditions and Successfully Attract Your Desires. And I'm also the founder of HipTalk.com and HypnoCloud apps, which gives you access to over 500 hypnosis recordings right in the palm of your hand. So be sure to download that app from the app stores today. And today I have a very special guest with me, Julie Ryan. Julie Ryan is a psychic and a medical intuitive who can sense what medical conditions and illnesses a person has and facilitate energetic healings. And she can also communicate with spirits, both alive and dead. Julie can scan animals, assess people's past lives and remove ghosts from homes and other buildings. And she can also tell how close to death someone is. Her book, Angelic, attendance, what really happens as we transition from this life into the next describes a series of events that involves angels, multitudes of deceased family and friends, the spirits of deceased pets and countless serendipitous and miraculous moments. Julie's children books, children's books, angel messages for kids, angel messages for dogs, angel messages for cats. That's my favorite <laughs> and picture books that have answer, uh, angels answering kids, tough questions. And each week, Julie scans callers on her ask Julie Ryan podcast, which is heard by millions in over a hundred countries throughout the world. Julie is a businesswoman, an inventor, an author, a radio show host podcaster and a serial entrepreneur and her surgical device inventions are sold globally and she has founded nine companies in five different industries julie's psychic and medical intuitive skills are learned and she can be found at ask julieryan.com and also on uh, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, all of them you can get there by typing in ask Julie Ryan. And today Julie is going to be sharing some of her insights on learning to use your intuition. So welcome to the show, Julie. Oh, my delight to be here. Thank you for having me. It is so great to have you and you're back there wearing my favorite color. Well, it's, it's a, a version. It's a, it's a shade of my favorite color. My favorite color is actually teal. You're wearing a beautiful turquoise and I love your necklace and Thank your you. backdrop. It's wonderful. So for those of you who are just listening to this, go over to YouTube and you can actually watch us do the interview here today. Cause I think it's going to be very fascinating. It's going to answer a lot of questions. So Julie, thank you so much for being here. Um, I've actually been, uh, you know, following you a little bit myself and I I've seen you pop up in like law of attraction magazine and on, uh, you know, TikTok, And I've, you know, I've watched a little bit of, of you. And I, so I've, I've actually been very curious to, at, you know, to interview you and to ask some of these questions, but before we like jump into the Q and a, just, could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Like uh, more than what I just shared, but just what got you started on this path? How did you become a, uh, intuitive, a psychic? Well, thank you for that introduction. I, I laugh. I tell people I'm not a psychic who's had dead people chasing her since childhood, or if I did, I didn't realize it, let alone what I, what would I have done with that information had I had it? <laughs> so I learned how to do this and Victoria, how it came about was a friend gave me a book called anatomy of the spirit by Carolyn Mace. 30 years ago, 30 some years ago. And I read it and she referred to herself as a medical intuitive. And I thought, what the heck is that? I'd never heard that term before. 
And as you mentioned in the intro, I've been in the medical industry in various capacities, always on the supply side of the equation. And I'm always interested in how can we help people heal? How can we help patients heal in the form of if this device is going to help in surgery and then in the end helps the patient heal, that would be good. If this product helps, that would be good, that kind of a thing. So it really piqued my interest. And back then we didn't have the internet yet. So I went, I did the old fashioned thing. I went to a bookstore. I went to a Barnes and Noble bookstore. There's a plug for Barnes and Noble. And <laughs> I, I just wanted to see what else was in there. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And I found a book called Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan. And Barbara Brennan is a former NASA physicist who has parlayed very complex quantum physics terminology into understandable English so that somebody with a non-scientific mind, that would be me, could understand it. And what she, what she did 40 some years ago, that's how old her, her teachings are, is she utilized quantum physics principles to help facilitate healing. And I read her book and I was interested to know more so I, now I look back and then I think, okay, I was being led step by step by step. And I called her she had school at the time and I called her school and I said, are you guys teaching this stuff in my area? Sure enough, there was a graduate of her school teaching in my town. And I studied with her for six years. And I say, I could have gotten an MD or a PhD for the money and the time and effort that I spent doing that but it's, it's what led me on, on this trajectory. And interestingly enough, Victoria, my friends at the time were saying, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know. I have no idea. It's just <laughs> interesting. And now fast forward all these years later and the last five years or so, this is what I do full time now. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that when we're led um, much like how I was led into my career path, it's hard to really explain to people exactly what you're doing or even to ourselves exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. But, you know, you, you speak to that in, you know, a lot of your teachings, it's, it really is about your intuition. It can't be like logically <laughs> explained. So, well, good for you on really tuning in and, and, you know, and, and being led. And, and I love that Carolyn Miss book myself. I, I actually read that back in the day as well. So, um, that's, uh, you know, that's very fascinating. So you probably already know, um, all the questions I'm going to ask you today, because <laughs> as we know, psychics, um, are people who read minds, right? <laughs> well, actually that's, you're right. That's what a lot of people believe. <laughs> and I don't find that to be the case mm -hmm. because I don't read anybody's minds. I believe that's an invasion of their privacy. What I do is I connect with them spiritually and have a conversation with their spirit. So I'm not going to be given any information that otherwise I wouldn't have access to. And it's really fascinating because oftentimes people will want me to scan a family member. This morning, I had a client who wanted me to, to work on her son who was 14. And so I'll ask telepathically, I'll ask that other person's permission. This kid, I said, okay, I'm talking to your mom. She wants me to scan you, do a medical scan. It's kind of like a, I'm a human MRI. Is it okay if I do that? And he said, yes, yeah, talk, talk to me about it. It's okay. If somebody says no, I won't scan them. Because like I said, I think it's an invasion of their privacy. I operate under HIPAA rules. Here in the US, we have the <laughs> health information uh, you know, information to, to keep it secure, supposedly, at least that's the intention. And, and I don't violate that. But as far as reading people's minds, when you're like in a Vegas act, and there's a magician and the magicians are reading somebody's mind, what they're doing is our heads are big satellite dishes, Victoria, and they receive and transmit frequencies. 
every spirit has a frequency that they keep throughout all of their lifetimes. And every thought has a frequency of its own as well. Thoughts do not originate in our heads. They originate in the ethers and we pull them in based on what we're thinking about. Now, thoughts are broadcast on a channel similar to a radio station. For instance, if you're listening to classic rock on 94.7, that's 94.7 megahertz. That's the frequency on which that music's being broadcast by that station. Thoughts are the same thing. So when somebody is, quote, reading somebody else's mind, what they've done is they've connected into that thought stream coming in from the ethers. And that's how they're able to tell what's going on. They're not inside somebody's head. It would be more like if I connected into the radio station with my radio, that radio station's already broadcasting the music. I tune my frequency on my radio to 94.7. I intercept that stream of music that's being played. Does that make that sense? Make, that makes perfect sense. So it's it's like this, um, you know, th- you're you're picking up the the thoughts that they're projecting out, and th- so our thoughts are going both ways, are through the ethers, essentially, is what you're saying. Yes, when we have a thought, it tunes our satellite dish head to that frequency of information, mm-hmm. and then thoughts come in. When you change your thought to something else, you change the channel. Because mm-hmm. you know how you'll have a thought that leads to another thought, leads to another thought, whether it's good or bad. Mm-hmm. Bad's probably a better illustration because we all have experienced this. We've experienced both, but especially thoughts that feel badly. It's like, oh my God, what if then this is going to happen, then that'll happen, then that'll happen, then that'll happen. Before you know, you've gotten yourself into this black hole and you feel terrible. Well, you're on the channel broadcasting those thoughts on that frequency. What you want to do is you want to change the channel. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the higher, it's, it's kind of like uh, the lower vibe and the higher vibe type of, of, of thoughts that, you know, and so as you're um, putting, you know, the, the positive thoughts out there, then you're going to be picking up more thoughts that are reflective of that same, that same energy frequency. Correct. And the universe The law of attraction, you know this, you're an Mm -hmm. expert on law of attraction, doesn't know the difference between something that's real and something that's imagined. Mm -hmm. So in an attractive universe, we're going to attract whatever it is we're thinking about because we're on that frequency. And that's why you want to change the channel if you're feeling badly, because emotion is an internal GPS system. We all come in with it. And it tells us if we feel neutral or good, whatever we're we're thinking is true. If we feel badly, that's our internal GPS system saying, hey, take a nanosecond. Is this a real fear? Is this a fake fear? Mm -hmm. Because all thoughts that feel badly are based in fear, jealousy, anger, actual fear, boredom, whatever. If it feels bad, it's bad based in fear. Is it a real fear? Something's going to harm you or kill you? Change the conditions before it does. Or is it a fake fear? Which is 99.9% of the thoughts we think that feel badly are, are based in a, in a fake fear, an irrational fear. That is, uh, that actually brings up a really, really good question for me that I have because, um, so like, let's just say that, you know, you've been in a habitual, pattern of, uh, you know, something bad that, uh, just continues to happen over and over again. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like I, you know, in the past, uh, used to pick, um, you know, really bad, uh, developers for my, um, you know, for, for my app. And so I've now moved into where I feel like I, you know, pick the right people, but I still, have these grumblings in my stomach or like something bad is going to happen. And I don't know the difference between, am I tapping into my intuition or am I projecting something that is still unresolved from my past? 
And how can a person like really tell the difference between those two things? What you're doing is you're tapping into a limiting belief that's false based in an irrational fear that's also false. Like, oh my God, if, you know, we're going down this black hole. If I get a developer and that developer is a crook and he steals my stuff and blah, 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 all the way down. And then you, and then you get paralyzed in fear. So what we want to do is we want to nip that in the bud. Mm -hmm. And this is a technique I came up with and it's called the two minute rule. Mm -hmm. And here's how it goes. When you have a thought that feels badly, you just ask, in your head, takes a nanosecond, you ask, is this going to kill me in the next two minutes? <laughs> and that's, that's the response question. a lot of the time. If it is, get out of the road before the truck runs you over. Right? <laughs> right. If it isn't, which is 99.9% .9 of the time, you know that's a limiting belief that's false based in an irrational fear that's false. As soon as you do that, you change the channel. Because what this does is it lets us be able to have a truth barometer instantly. And we don't get stuck. We, we stop that before we go into the black hole. And then we're sending out that vibe and we're attracting exactly what we don't want. So the two minute rule, is this going to kill me in the next two minutes? I love it because it's free. And it's convenient. It works anywhere your brain is. Your brain's usually with you wherever you are. <laughs> and you can use it usually. unlimited times. Yeah, usually. You could use it unlimited times in as many situations as you want every day. And when, when that becomes a habit, what happens is then you're in a frequency where you feel good most of the time. You're attracting more good feeling things. This gets into your wheelhouse now mm -hmm. where your expertise is. And also we can get guidance because to your point earlier, Victoria, spirit doesn't communicate on the I feel crappy channels because the frequency is too low. So when you have a thought that comes in, oh, maybe I'll check out that website. Maybe I'll talk to this person. Maybe I'll go to the bookstore or go to the library. That's all coming in from spirit, your spirit, your spirit guides, God, the universe, your angels, whoever, all, all the collective consciousness. And when we're on that hamster wheel of fear, nothing changes. The more we try and control a situation, the more we attract what we don't want. So the yes. two minute rule is so helpful. So whenever we're, you're feeling that yuckiness, that is your GPS telling you that you're thinking unproductive, fearful, limiting thoughts. And you're not going to get anything good out of that. I mean, there's no reason. I mean, you know, the two minute rule, ask yourself that if it's not going to kill you, then change the channel because now we we're into, we're back into creation mode before we're just in reaction mode. Right. Right. And a couple of other points. It's not telling you that the fear is false. It's telling you this is worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Is this a real fear or is this a fake fear? Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a fake fear. So that's number one. Number two, when you feel good 100% of the time, you're dead because <laughs> we create out of the contrast. When we know what we don't want, it helps us create what we do want. And, and Having that internal GPS system called emotion is such a benefit because it helps us create and it helps us know if this is a real fear or a fake fear. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that because, you know, it, by just tuning in to your emotions, which, you know, um, we, we do kind of naturally, uh, we're able to tell if our, if our thoughts are, you know, producing what, what we want rather than what we don't want. So when we tune into those emotions, we listen to the thought we hear, okay, now we can, we can go ahead and, and create whatever thoughts we, we want to be thinking because, you know, I, the way I'm kind of seeing that is that, um, you know, this is like an old pattern. So, that, so you have to interrupt that pattern. Right. Yeah. Versus just send that thought away with love and watch it fade away. Well, you're still in the same frequency. You're still in the same channel. You got to change the channel. You got to disrupt that somehow. Mm -hmm. And the two minute rule works. 
funny thing about the two minute rule, I've been teaching it for a while. One of the a couple of quick stories, little teeny children can use it. There was a, a gal who's a client and I was talking to her and she said her daughter got in the car from school and in that pickup lane, she said, mommy, I used the two minute rule today. I think she was a first grader. So she probably was six-ish. And she said, really, tell me what happened. And her daughter said, well, Susie, I don't remember the kid's name. Susie stole my ball on the playground and I got really mad and I wanted to beat her up. And then I thought, is this going to kill me in the next two minutes if she steals my ball? And I thought, <laughs> no. And the mom said, so what did you do? And she said, well, I went and I talked to Susie and I said, you know, you stole my ball. Can we play together? Aww. And she and Susie played together. And so this six-year-old had a problem solving technique that she understood. Little teeny children get this. And when you, when you teach it to them, my goodness, what can they avoid in their lives by doing this kind of a quick nanosecond of a mental note that you can do while you're talking to somebody that you can do while you're doing something else. I mean, it's we, our brains multitask, not just women, men's do too. Women's do better, but men's do too. <laughs> and then the opposite end of the spectrum, one of the graduates of my training is a physician in London and she had a, a uh, parliament member come and say, I need anti-anxiety medication because I'm so stressed out. I can't take this. And I feel like I'm going to burst. And so this doctor said, well, let me teach you this technique. So she taught her the two minute rule. And then two weeks later, the, the parliament member that she was a Tory party member came back and she said, oh my God, you were so right. We, I taught it to my staff. My staff taught it to other friends on other members staffs they taught it to their members it, the two minute rules being used in parliament in london now and so opposite crazy. ends of the spectrum you know of being able to problem solve and and when we nip it in the bud victoria what happens is we avoid being in fight or flight we avoid releasing cortisol which we means we avoid creating inflammation in Infl chronic inflammation leads to what disease and illness so it not only helps us be much calmer but it helps us from a medical and a physical standpoint so it really it really is a technique that works great i love it and i i love it when my guests teach our uh, you know our our listeners techniques that they can you know very easy very easy to understand very easy to apply so thank you so much for for sharing that technique um, and if you have any, any more techniques like that, um, I'd love, love, love to, to hear them, but, um, let's, um, let's get into this, you know, whole, um, you know, intuition and, and learning, you know, to be psychic and learning to communicate, like, is this a special gift that only some people have, or, you know, can, you know, are, are, is everyone innately, in, intuitive? Can we learn this? Yes. Everybody comes in with the hardware. It's just a matter of developing and then enhancing it. We've all had experiences in our lives where we think of somebody or we, we see a picture of them and it reminds us of something to do with them. And then all of a sudden, next thing we know, we get a text from them or an email or a phone call. We think, oh, it was just thinking about you and here you are. What a coincidence. No coincidences in life. That's your intuitive ability. You're sending out that thought because you're focused on that person's vibration. Their spirit again has a frequency. They pick it up. They respond. So everybody has had that experience. Yes, we all have the ability. It's just a matter of learning how to, to recognize it, how to, how to be able to tap into it, and then how to validate it. Mm -hmm. Most of us will have a thought if we've lost a loved one and something happens and we'll say, oh, that's from, my, that's from grandma. And then, and then what do we immediately do? We say, oh, that's just my imagination. That's not real. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making that up. No, it's that first thing that comes in your head instantly is what is true. That's, that's grandma communicating with you. That's grandma sending you a sign. Again, our heads are big satellite dishes. Go back to that concept. 
in order to communicate with anybody that's deceased, whether you knew them or not is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Who do you want to talk to? Your dead grandmother, Moses, Aristotle, George Washington, it doesn't matter. You think of them, that connects you into their spirit. And then you just say something to them, either aloud or in your head, can be a question, can be a statement. They're going to respond. How you know it's coming from them is it happens in an instant, as fast as you can snap your fingers or before. Oftentimes, spirit will be answering your question before you've even thought of it all the way. And that's how you know that that's from spirit. When you think about it for a couple of seconds, that's your brain talking to you. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. The more you do this, the more validation you're going to get, the more validation you get, the more you trust it. And that is just second nature. You know, the way I have described that, um, and I'm not really sure if this is the same thing as channeling or, you know, just receiving, um, you know, insights from you know, from people, or if it's kind of like the same thing, but I always, the way I've described that strengthening of that intuition and, and, um, and strengthening the bond, you know, between you and your intuition is that, you know, when you take the information and you apply it and, um, you know, when, when you get these, um, strong insights, but then you don't do anything with it, then I think that, uh, you know, kind of closes the, off the communication channel because of you're almost like disrespecting, you know, the, the advice, like if you just, you know, if you went to a wise person, and you kept asking them questions and they kept giving you the answers and then you weren't doing anything with it, you know, eventually they're going to say, well, you're not really going <laughs> to use this information anyway. So Uh, Well, what, you know, what are your thoughts? That's the way I've always kind of explained it to people. A couple of thoughts on that. Number one, utilize the two minute rule. Mm -hmm. When you don't act, you're in fear. What are you Mm -hmm. afraid of? Is this a real fear? Is this a fake fear? When you're in fear, spirit doesn't communicate with you because the vibration, the frequency is too low. Mm -hmm. Because you think about spirit is just energy without a body. When our spirit's connected to our body, what happens is it slows down the vibration simply because the body has mass. So spirit's pure love. Spirit's not up there going, oh, you know, you're just not paying attention to me. So (laughs) I'm not going to mess around with you anymore. That's a human emotion. Spirits are all pure love. All they know how to do is send love. Mm -hmm. Spirits are not going to interfere with our lives. They're going to intercede and intervene if asked. So they're not reading our thoughts, but they are putting ideas into our heads And to your point, does it make sense for me to act on this? Can I get out of enough fear to be able to act on this? And then when we ask for their help, they are more than happy to oblige. You say, hey, grandma, I need you to help me find my lost bracelet. And then grandma's going to help. But before then, grandma's just going to be watching you, looking around for your lost bracelet, wondering where the heck, what the heck did I do with it? And, and so that's my understanding and my experience of how spirit works. I use the analogy, Victoria, of the sun. I talk in analogies a lot because mm-hmm. it gives our human minds a frame of reference for all this woo-woo stuff that we're talking about. <laughs> and, well, really, and I, and I use the example of the sun. If you think about it, the sun does one thing. It shines. It don't care if it's raining where you are. If it's cloudy, the sun's still shining. It's just mm-hmm. shining. Yeah, That's you may not be able does. to see it. It might be exactly. covered up by the clouds. Yeah, exactly. But the sun just shines. And that's what spirit does. Spirit just loves, just sends love. There's not all, all of the behavior, personality behaviors stay with the body when somebody dies. So the most atrocious human that ever lived, their spirit's pure love. They're in heaven with everybody else. And that personality profile of that person stayed with the body that was their role that they assumed in this lifetime similar to a an actor in a play that is an amazing analogy the sun just shines the spirits just love and the the personality dies with the 
uh, with the, the body that really makes so much sense because like, so the personality and the body are like, to, they, they come as a package essentially. And this is, this is the body and the, uh, you know, and the character that I, you know, am playing in this lifetime, but the spirit that's just that pure love and, you know, is, is still, you know, is still out there. It's still, uh, you know, and, and speaking of that, um, you know, since you mentioned that it dies with the body, that the, the, uh, the character, the role, uh, the personality dies with the body. So the spirit, does it ever come back and, and assume another role in another lifetime? Yes. Yes, that, that, that's why past lives are so much fun. I do past life scans all the time. And it's it's different. Of course, I'm an entrepreneur. I have to do it in a different way. Right? <laughs> but I, I will imagine myself in this endless hallway that has very narrow walls and very tall ceilings, maybe a 30 or 40 foot tall ceiling, Victoria. And on the walls are big square mirrors line up perfectly perfectly vertically and horizontally as far as the eye can see you know into infinity and each mirror represents a different lifetime so we'll ask a question like does victoria have any past lives in which she was a writer and a, and, a, and published a book and then those lifetimes that correlate with that question will come out from the wall those mirrors that represent those lifetimes as if they're on a hydraulic arm and then I'll say, show me the one that correlates the most. That one will come out the farthest. And then I'll envision walking into it and I'll be given where it was, when it was, a little bit about what went on. And then we'll correlate it with what's happening in your current life. So it really gives us lots of information. And an analogy I like to use for past lives that I think ties into your question is, think of Hamlet. How many times has Hamlet been performed since Shakespeare wrote it in 1602. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but think about where was it performed? In what country, in what city, in what language? What was the year? What was happening in the world? Who were the actors? Who was the director? Who was the set designer? Who was the costumer? All of that same script, different perspective each time. So lifetimes we come in with things that we want to explore. And I'll see snippets of that script go through multiple lifetimes. And so we can look at it from a different perspective. So you Let's may say, be, you may like have the same theme kind of yes. throughout several different lifetimes. Okay. Exactly. Let's say I talk to parents sometimes who have a child who committed suicide or a spouse or a parent or a loved one. And that that is just so hard to understand for the people who are left behind. And do we know for sure we'll know when we're dead, but it, certainly it's feasible that perhaps in many past lives, the suicide theme was there, but the person who committed suicide in this life was the parent of, the spouse of, the sibling of, the friend of, the colleague of, the doctor of, whatever. In this round, they wanted to explore what it was like to be the person who actually committed the suicide. And I, I can see people's light bulbs in their heads turning on, you know, with, well, that, that's, it's certainly feasible. It certainly helps lessen trying to figure out why this person really got to that point and did that and, and left under those circumstances. So it's, it's really fascinating. Past lives are just a blast. Oftentimes we can find historic documents that corroborate whatever the information is that we get. And that's really fun when that happens. Yeah, no, that's really, really fascinating. And I, I really like the way you put that with, you know, experiencing the different perspectives of it. And it, it really does help to, you know, ease the pain of the suffering that people go through. Like, if you look at it from that perspective, um, you know, it's like, even though, um, you know, in our human 
bodies and our human personalities and, and what we're here to experience, you know, we're, it's, it's very real for us when, uh, you know, somebody does something awful, like gets raped or, um, you know, gets killed or, or whatever, but like looking at it from this perspective, you could, you know, well, you know, did we, did we choose that? Did we go into this, the spirit realm after we passed from one life and say like, yeah, I, I, you know, I want to be the raper this time or whatever. I mean, you know, it's a horrible thing to say, but you know, up, up there, there's no bad or good or right or wrong or any of that. It's just, it's just a role. It's just. Exactly. Bingo. You hit the nail on the head with that. Spirit has told me for years, there's no right or wrong, good or bad in heaven. We just send love. They just see it as an experience. They see every experience as fun and interesting. That makes our human minds want to explode. We say fun. How could that be fun? This is horrific. Doesn't, does not seem fun. (laughs) Right. And at the same time, any actor that is a veteran will tell you the most fun roles that they ever played were of the villains Mm -hmm. because the personality is so complicated and they get to really explore different nuances of a mind that maybe is a criminal mind or an abusive mind or a, or a mentally ill mind. And they get to explore that and they find it to be fun and fascinating. And that is my analogy for spirit coming in to play a bad guy, you know, in this lifetime, they're going, Oh, that'd be fun if we did that. And this will be fun. And at the same time, the people who were their victims are saying, okay, in this round, I'm going to be a victim. So I can see what it feels like to do that again, really hard to grasp from our human frame of reference. However, The one important point to remember is that time doesn't exist in the spirit world. Time is a human creation. And therefore, a hundred lifetimes of a hundred years apiece may not even be a blip on the radar screen Mm because time isn't a thing. And so that's, that's what I believe based on working with thousands of people over the years and talking with thousands of spirits over the years that tell me the same thing. They'll say, no, it's just a role. It's like in a movie or a play. So this gives me like, this generates, you know, it's it's interesting when you start going down the rabbit hole of this conversation, how many other questions that generate. So I've got like three that are like top of my mind. Um, And I don't know in which order you, I'll just give you the topics. Soulmates, aliens, pets. Okay. <laughs> and as far and all having to do with past lives or or um you know reincarnation into you know these other worlds or beings. Yeah, what's your question about them? So um for for one, when when it comes to the past lives, because you say that uh, you know, we're um, you know, playing different roles, different themes. Um, you know, how would you say that relates with, with soulmates? Like, do you, do you believe in soulmates? Um, is there, is, is there any relevance between, uh, going into, you know, your past, like, you know, do, do we, like, I feel like we probably a lot of soulmates, you know, we sort of travel together through the different lifetimes and maybe sometimes, you know, you're, uh, you know, trading roles and some, maybe sometimes even, you know, you might even be a parental ch- child relationship, you know? So I just kind of wanted to get your, your take on the whole soulmate um, idea when, when it comes to past lives and reincarnating and things like that. Well, the, the literature and the entertainment business and the greeting card business would, would lead us all to believe that we only have one true soulmate in our life. That's the romantic soulmate. And most of us have more than one. Most of us have dated people and then married people. And and we always have a fondness in our heart for the person who was our soulmate at that time in our life. And then we've moved on. What I'm told from spirit and what seems to be more, seems to resonate more with me is that everyone that we know in our lives from our parents to our our spouses, our children, our grandparents, our friends, our colleagues, 
they're all soulmates. Even the checkout clerk at the grocery store, that's a soulmate. When you see that person, everybody in our life is a soulmate. We're all playing a different role. And there are lots of schools of thought that we travel in soul families. Mm -hmm. When you meet somebody and you just know, okay, this, this person feels like I've known them all my life. What's up with this? Am I having deja vu? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. And and so yes, soulmates are absolutely a thing. Past lives, we can go back and we can say, okay, what's our relationship in a past life? Were we sisters? Were we mother and daughter, mother and son, whatever? And we can find that information. Some people get hung up on that and they go, well, you were my mother in my past life. And well, yeah, great. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I don't know that it really has, you know, much reference other than what was their relationship and what are you exploring in this life? It's about what's happening now mm-hmm. is, is where it comes. I have a fun, st- a couple of fun stories, if I may, on past lives. My, my all time favorite is I have a client, a graduate of my class who is a flight attendant Mm. and she uh, was flying for um, all Nippon Airways, a Japanese Airways, but she was living in London at the time, an Italian girl living in London. She'd never picked up a pair of chopsticks ever in her life. And uh, that's important to remember for this story. But her question was, why can't I find a man who's willing to commit? The men that I meet are wonderful, but they don't want to commit. And I want to get married and have a family. Fine. So we did a past life. I said, does she have any past lives? This one comes out. I walk in. It's Kyoto, Japan at the turn of the 20th century, like late 1800s. She's a geisha in that lifetime. Oh. Well, what's a geisha? A geisha is sponsored financially by a man normally who's married and they're their escort. They're their extra. They're their other. You know, that man who's the geisha sponsor can't ever commit to her, but there's is still in her life. Yeah. And when I told her, I said, okay, you were a geisha in Kyoto, Japan in 18, whatever it was, and she gasped. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, that's where I did my training when I flew for ANA. And she said, I got there where I was, all the other girls in the training were Japanese. I had never picked up a pair of chopsticks. I knew how to use them from the start. She said, my my fellow classmates were teasing me and saying, oh, you're lying about that because you use chopsticks as well as we do. We've been using it since the cradle. (laughs) So that was fun. And then another one that's one of my favorites is that there was a there's a gentleman who's a client who's a a um, very successful executive of a publicly traded massive company and he had cancer when he came to me and so we were working on him physically and and we did a past life thing as part of his physical healing his medical healing and what we found was that he was a an admiral in the British Navy in 1700 and something, and he controlled the Atlantic fleet. And he's very well known for some battle with the French in 1700 and something. I don't know naval history for Britain. I, you know, I know some naval history for America, but I don't know British naval history. Well, we looked up, we got the guy's name. We got all this information, what the battle was that he was famous for all that. All of it was was absolutely verifiable online with historic documents. So then we made the correlation. Well, he was used to commanding massive numbers of people in that lifetime. In this lifetime, he's commanding multiple, you know, massive numbers of people in multiple locations where his company has offices. And he's really good at leading, but not as good at receiving. Well, when you're sick, what do you have to do? Especially when you have cancer, you got to let the doctors help you and the nurses help you and your family and your friends and all of that. So that was what he was exploring this round. But you can see the thread of the same story in both of those examples where there were nuances that were the same. They were just being applied at a different time in a different place. That makes so much sense. So, so 
a lot of, you know, the, we're, we're still kind of completing the story from other lifetimes, perhaps, and that, yes. and that's setting up the, you know, it's kind of setting up the role or the situation, uh, the events that, you know, who we're going to meet and, and all of that, it's setting up what's going to happen in this, this lifetime, because we have to, you know, it's like part one, part two, part three, exactly. <laughs> this, this life is, you know, part 853,000. <laughs> and then we go back to heaven and we think, okay, I've checked it out from these vantage points. What if I look at it from this vantage point? So I'm going to choose that mom and dad. I'm going to be born at that time in that place into those circumstances. So my life will have a trajectory that will allow me to explore and experience this next round of, you know, what episode 15 is going to be. That is fascinating. That is, that is so fascinating. Um, so I had brought up, uh, animals and, uh, you know, so, so can you, can you talk to me about, uh, our ability to like, well, first of all, there's, that's like two prong. Can we telepathically communicate with our animals? Um, and can they telepathically communicate with us? And I'm going to assume we can because you do deal with, uh, you know, animal communication. Um, but also, um, does, does our lifetime, do our lifetimes that we incarnate into only extend into human form or can we extend into, you know, different animals or, you know, have we been animals or will, will we ever be, you know, uh, incarnate into animal form? Great question. My take on that is that we're human, animals are animal. Okay. And there are lots of schools of thought that we develop, kind of like a take on the Darwin theory. You start off as a one cell amoeba and then you go into a worm and then you go into a lizard and then you go into a whatever and then an orangutan and then a whatever, whatever, whatever that would be the evolution to human. That's what a lot of people believe since the beginning of time, that that's what happened. Is that what happened? I get a yes on that when I ask spirit. Do we come back as an animal? No, because that's regressing. Our spirit expands with each experience, each lifetime, each experience, and it gets bigger and we want to see things that are more advanced each time. And so that's what I get. That's my belief. As far as animals reincarnating, I'm told by spirit that they do not. Hmm. I am told by spirit that they, and I know this, that the animal spirit stays around the person and is with the person when they're dying. Even that's one of the spirits that shows up as what I call the part of the welcome to heaven committee. And so there, there was a movie out with Dennis Quaid that was really cute about the dog that reincarnated. I don't remember what it was called. Did you see that? It yeah. was cute. Yeah, it was a what I can't remember the name of it. A dog's yeah. life, I think, yes, is what it's yes, called. A dog's life. Yes. And it was darling. Mm -hmm. But I get that that's not how it works. Now, the dog's spirit is around us. Mm -hmm. The dog can help send other dogs, but that dog's spirit then is advancing to other forms. So that the dog's sense. not going to come back as a dog but it's going to ad advance to something else is, so, is kind of my take on that. So that is, that's interesting. I, you know, so we, I have, we have three cats and then we had three cats prior to these three cats and each one of them, you know, had their time. Um, but I always kind of felt that my, my Isabella who left us last, um, you know, incarnated into velvet and, you know, cause like, I feel the very the similar bond with that cat and then the same thing with um tyson it was really weird because we felt like tyson actually incarnated into sebastian sebastian's name when we adopted him was tyson which is crazy oh wow yeah <laughs> and then our calvin has a very similar you know um 
you know, uh, energy as, as our emerald. And so like, we, we felt like all three of our cats, like kind of came back to us in, in these, you know, in these three cats. So, you know, like one way or another, I mean, it doesn't matter if, if it's true or not, but we, we've just always kind of felt like, you know, we got our, <laughs> our family back. <laughs> well, when you were talking about is Isabella and velvet, yeah, Isabella said, well, who do you think tells her how to behave? Who do you think <laughs> taught her? And, and so that's funny. And it's obviously something that's legit. Cause that thought came in from that's Isabella, oh. kind of like, Isabella was training Velvet how to behave and Tyson was training Sebastian how to behave. Yep. And then yep. what was the, the last three? Um, the, the Cal third Calvin one? into Emerald. <laughs> Calvin into Emerald. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what I get. People will say, well, uh, when we die, do we turn into angels? And I say, no, angels are their own species. It's kind of like oh. comparing a schnauzer to a dandelion. They're yeah. different species. And that makes sense. Yeah. But where we're the human species is where we evolve to. And that's that's kind of the top of the food chain kind of a thing. And then, you, you know, there are the ascended masters and there are people that are are very wise and the Dalai Lama or the Pope or the, you know, the whoever head of whatever religious or spiritual organization, the Maharishi or whatever, those, those are all people that are, we think of as being very evolved. Sometimes you'll hear they're an old soul. Well, we're all old souls. We all are, are, have lived many, 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 many lifetimes. The other thing too, I think, I think that's important to remember, Victoria, is we're trying to make sense of this woo-woo stuff from our human frames of reference. And there isn't really something that we can compare it to. So be easy with yourself. I'm saying to your listeners, be easy on this because it's not an absolute. No, it's this way and not that way. Is it possible it's this way? Yes. Is it possible it's some other way or it has a nuance that's different from what we've explored so far? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Cause it's, it's just, it's, it's our perspective from everything that we have experienced here in our human form. And, you know, it's almost impossible for us to all like know the truth, um, you know, because, you know, we're just experiencing it through our own, you know, perspective. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's so many more questions I want to ask you. This is such an interesting topic, but, um, you know, we're already into this for, you know, close to an hour now. And so I want to give our listeners a chance to get a little bit more of you. And, um, so you have a, you're offering a, your your book, uh, yes. digital book and your audio book, uh, yeah. to our listeners today. Can you tell them a little sure. bit about that? I have, I have show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. For those of you that are watching, I kind of feel like a game show hostess, you know, <laughs> uh, angelic attendance. What really happens as we transition from this life into the next, exactly. <laughs> if you want a free copy of this, just go to askjulieryan.com, click on the Ask Julie button, say, hey, I heard you on Victoria's show. I'd love a copy of your book. We'll send you a link to download a free audiobook version or digital version of this, first of all. And then my three children's books, Angel Messages for Cats, for Kids, oh. and for Dogs. They are children's books that have like, 15 sentences, short sentences in them, but they're primarily picture books. Oh, and the illustrations are just darling. And it talks are. about how we are, we all come in with the ability, we're a spirit attached to a body, all of that. These came about because I've had so many moms over the years, Victoria, who've said, can you please help me explain to my small child what happens when somebody dies? And we say, well, honey, grandpa's in heaven. And my four-year-old says, no, he's not. He's asleep in that box up there because they're at the funeral home for mm -hmm. visitation hours. Mm -hmm. Or the child who says, 
uh, that they know about past lives and they come up with information that can be corroborated with historic documents. And then there's always the child that will say that they are talking to a deceased loved one in their room. And we think, well, that's their imaginary friend until they come back and they say, well, I'm talking to grandpa and grandpa told me to tell you this, 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 and it's, a, it's able to be verifiable. And you just think this child can't even read yet. There's no way they would know this information. And so that's how these books came about. And they've, they're just darling and they've been very well received. The new one is Angel Messages for Truth, colon, the two minute rule. Ooh, so I've had several that. moms say, can you put that in a children's book? I said, yeah. Oh, so that's wonderful. That's one. mm -hmm. So they can ask for if if they have children, they can ask for the digital versions of those children. Yeah, if they want well. the book for dogs or for cats or for whatever, then we'll send the digital version of that too. If you want the paperback, you can buy those. But but the audio book and the digital, the children's books really are good in paperback because it's kind of hard to get the same feeling, you know, on a, on a, a pad, an iPad or a laptop but you'll you'll get the gist of it that way and they can get those books on amazon or any anywhere. other place yeah. anywhere amazon barnes and noble apple books wherever great awesome well it has been my pleasure having you on the show you're so interesting this topic is so fascinating and you're so knowledgeable on it so thank you so much for sharing your time and your spirit and your generous energy uh, today with us and our audience my honor. Thank you for having me. Sending you love Mwah! from Sweet Home, Alabama. <laughs>